what's your Army MOS test worth to you? A few extra dollars in your pocket every month? You know, this test is actually worth a lot more than just extra bread. It not only qualifies you for pro-pay, but also affects actions concerning your promotions, training, assignments, and even retention. A low score in certain subject areas may hinder your career progression. When the time comes for you to take your MOS test, don't brush it aside lightly. The extra time you spend on it may well be worth your while. The American military's forces follow Operation Dewey Canyon 2, operated in South Vietnam due to the Cooper Church Amendments prohibiting forces from entering Laos. The South Vietnamese arm of the operation will be Lam Son 719, named after the birthplace of legendary Vietnam patriot Le Loi. 719 comes from the year 1971 and the vital route 9. The abandoned Khe San combat base will be the nerve center of the assault. Route 9, leading into Khe San, will be cleared by engineers for the South Vietnamese to use in their assault. The plan is for U.S. forces in South Vietnam to guard the border from within and create diversions. Following, the South Vietnamese Army will attack Laotian town Chie Ni, the perceived nerve center of the NV base 604. Finally, the South Vietnamese will carry out search and destroy missions within Thich Ni and, when finished, make their way back to South Vietnam. Skirting the Cooper Church, American artillery will provide support directly to the South Vietnam side of the Laotian border, while air support will be provided outside of the Khe San base. Route 9 to Laos is secured to the Laotian border by February 5th, and a new airstrip is built and ready for operation by February 15th. Meanwhile, the 101st Airborne Division begin a faint attack away from Khe San to distract North Vietnam's attention. North Vietnamese troops in base area 604 are estimated at 22,000. February 8, 1970. It starts with a 4,000-man South Vietnamese Armor and Infantry Task Force moving west down Route 9 to Laos, undisturbed. Their northern flank is covered by airborne and ranger elements to the north. Two ranger battalions are airlifted to LZs designated as early warning areas for North Vietnamese incursions. The 1st Infantry Division covers the southern flank of the advance in several LZs. It does not stay peaceful for long. American air support helicopters are fired upon by North Vietnamese artillery and machine gun positions. The poor conditions of Route 9 make it impossible for all but tracked vehicles to travel. The armored forces make it in to their objective on February 11th, establishing a fire base at A. Louis, 20 kilometers inside Laos on Route 9, where they establish central command of the operation. As the South Vietnamese forces await orders to proceed, valuable time is lost, allowing the North Vietnamese to funnel in massive troop reinforcements. The Communists are kept diverted by a U.S. Naval Task Force off the North Vietnam coast, who appear to be staging an amphibious landing 20 kilometers from the city of Vinh. They soon catch on to the South Vietnamese actions in Laos and move 36,000 troops to the area of Che Ni by March. The South Vietnamese are outnumbered two to one. By February 18th, the NV forces start attacking the fire bases. First, pounding them with long-range anti-aircraft artillery, and then finishing off the job with ground troops. After three days of fighting the 39th ARVN Ranger Battalion, over 600 North Vietnamese troops are killed, but 75% of the Rangers are left alive to retreat. Meanwhile, South Vietnamese President Chu and General Lam decide to divert operations immediately towards Chepo Ni. 
Many believe that a victory in Cheponi was Chu's objective all along. It would be symbolic and boost his image for the upcoming elections. On March 3rd, elements of the 1st Division are hella lifted to two fire bases and an LZ. The damage incurred on air battalions is catastrophic. 11 helicopters are shot down and another 44 damaged while carrying a single battalion. On March 6th, 276 UH-1 helicopters, protected by gunships and fighter jets, left two battalions from Quezon to Cheponi. It is the largest helicopter assault of the war. When the South Vietnamese forces arrive in Cheponi, all they find are the bodies of North Vietnamese soldiers killed by airstrikes. As South Vietnamese forces beat a retreat, the North Vietnamese apply further pressure. At battle's end, 7,682 South Vietnamese are killed, 215 U.S. soldiers, more than 100 helicopters are lost, and 600 damaged. It is believed that North Vietnam suffers 20,000 lost through sheer American bombardment. Perhaps the greatest enemy of the operation were the media, who stumbled on the story early and let word slip, as well as the insubordination within the South Vietnamese military. Still, Operation Lam Sun 719 was a South Vietnamese operation conducted without American advisors and seen as a step towards Nixon's Vietnamization. April 23, 1971. Army Warrant Officer Fred Behrens, airborne, undertakes a fateful helicopter mission to save wounded U.S. troops. It was a, uh, a hot mission, which meant that the, the people on the ground were in, co in contact with the enemy. With air cover by Cobra helicopters, Behrens and his crew are riding high stakes. His second trip, in to airlift wounded out, will place him amongst their ranks. We landed and everybody jumped on the aircraft that was on the ground. And uh, as I picked it up to a high hover, uh, I got shot through the left ankle and it blew my, my left foot off the control pedal and we went into a, a hard right hand spin. Um, pain was intense and I jammed my foot down uh, back on the pedal, but I couldn't feel anything, but I felt my right foot coming back up and I knew that I had my foot on the, on the pedal and I got the aircraft under control and I continued the turn to the left. And uh, at that time they had hit us, I believe in the engine with an M79 uh, grenade his crew chief killed by enemy fire, Behrens manages to bring the craft down. When he calls in a mayday, Behrens is told that the LZ is too hot for any more rescues. He is on his own in a war zone. A U.S. Cobra fires its minigun the next morning, hitting Baron and killing his crew chief with friendly fire. A North Vietnamese sniper strikes later, killing another of the crew before shooting Barons, who takes the sniper down himself. And at that time, it was just uh, myself and Izako Melo, this one ranger, and we moved again. And uh, a uh, you know two North Vietnamese opened up on us with their machine gun, and uh, the Izako was out of ammunition by that time, and I fired up on the two North Vietnamese and got them. And uh, uh, Izako said we needed to go and start heading toward the Asheville Valley floor. And I told him I couldn't, by that time I'd been shot five times and I told him I couldn't make it any further. So, and I told him to keep on going. And he, uh, uh, we, we discussed that and he didn't want to leave me, but I told him to keep on going. So he got up and he ran for the floor, for the Asheville. And uh, he ended up being captured the next morning the North Vietnamese are not the only threat left for the wounded barons to face, but the war zone itself. The, uh, on Sunday the 25th, I'd, I crawled out in the middle of the landing zone and uh, 
a fighter came in, the Phantom, and he dropped off a pair of bombs. And they went, they landed on both sides of me. I was down in a little, uh, 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 little bomb crater in between a couple of uh, tree trunks. And, uh, uh, and uh, bombs landed on each side of me and blew me and my tree trunks up in the air. And uh, it, uh, that I ended up getting some shr shrapnel wounds in me. And it, uh, that was, I figured it was, it was just about all over for me. A group of rangers happen upon barons while pursuing the enemy. They leave their canteens with the parched barons, hesitant to leave him. Fred Barons is medevaced out shortly after. His injuries stay with him the rest of his life. I was in the hospital for uh, almost a year and as an inpatient and uh, as an outpatient, uh, well, I'm still an outpatient, but uh, uh, I was uh, uh, being treated as an inpatient on a very frequent basis for several years afterwards. And it, uh, uh, it uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the wounds just don't heal up quickly. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.